You're listening to the Higher Ideas Podcast, where ideas grow. Connect on Twitter, YouTube, iTunes, or higherideas.net. Now here's your host, I. Hello, fellow human, and welcome back to the Higher Ideas Podcast. And welcome me back to my own podcast, because once again, despite trying to come back uh, about a year ago, once again I've been gone. Um, and at this point, it's been about two years since I've consistently put content onto this podcast, and I apologize for that, but this time I mean it, I'm coming back for real. And I can say that for real this time, because the reason I've been gone for two years is finally out of the way. The book that I have been writing for the past two years to the point of quitting my job a year ago so that I could finish the thing, is finally finished. And I feel there should be some kind of fanfare for that. Yes, the book is out of the way. And now I find myself free to come back to the podcast that I've missed the whole time I've been gone. Uh, I'm not kidding when I say this podcast has been on my mind the entire time I've been working on this book, to the point that I actually have had episodes in my head while editing the book. Uh, A fresh new topic would come into mind, and I'd go through an entire development phase for an episode while I was working, and then I would just have to let it go. But in life, you have to prioritize, right? You have to make choices and figure out what is more pressing and what needs to be handled first, and the Higher Ideas podcast just came in second to this book. And you know what, this might be a good time actually to re-examine what this podcast is or is supposed to be, uh, what it means to me and what I'm trying to do with it. Uh, since I've been away for two years, it might be a good thing to sort of uh, clarify the path ahead. So the Higher Ideas podcast started several years ago um, during a time in my life where things were happening really fast. I was being bombarded, really, by a whole series of uh, realizations and events, and uh, just my thoughts were breaking into new territories on all sorts of things, and my whole world was repeatedly flipping upside down, and I just, I was just constantly having these wow moments about small little thoughts or about big complex thoughts, uh, for whatever reason... I was having just a huge, just barrage of these, I guess you could call them higher ideas. Uh, Thoughts that would come through me, that I would consider and ponder, and at the other end, I would find myself somehow grown, somehow stronger, somehow clearer, somehow enhanced by these ideas, just by going through them. And once these ideas were gone, once they had gone through me, really they would just be discarded because they they had done their work on me and I would move on to the next. But I couldn't help but think, man, these these things have had such an awesome impact on me and my life is improving by leaps and bounds because of these concepts. Isn't it a shame that they just have to disappear and... I'll go on and live a life that may affect the world in a better way, but no one else is going to be transformed by this thought unless they find it themselves. Now, couldn't I take that thought and bottle it and share it with others? And couldn't that experience uh, sort of instill them with the growth or the enlightenment or the aha that I had? It was basically an effort in capturing the the hailstorm of enlightenments that uh, that was coming through my life. Or at least that has been my intention, because I do believe that the intent you put into a thing somehow drives the result. So I'd like to think that it's helping someone out there somehow to uh, find just a little bit more personal power, just a little bit more growth, a little bit more clarity of vision through listening to the podcast. And really, while I was working on this podcast more frequently, 
Uh, I felt it was the most important thing I was doing with my life. I mean, I had a, a job that doesn't really change the world in any beneficial way. Uh, I was trying to touch people in my own little life, but that's a very limited effect you're having on the world. So this podcast definitely was a very important part of my life. And even before the book came along and tore me off of that for a while, uh, I was actually having frustrations with this podcast. And that's because... I just couldn't keep up with what was happening in my life. And these aha moments that I was trying to represent on the podcast uh, very frequently built on top of each other. For me personally, I would have one and it would lead into the next. What I learned from one thought would point me towards another thought and help me to understand a more complex thought, which would give me more complex growth. So this was a very cumulative sort of process that was happening to me. And I very quickly realized that if I wanted to try and share that with people, I would probably have to keep in step. Um, I would probably have to represent the progression over time on the podcast so people can listen from episode one and follow all the way to however crazy things got and always know that there was a logical progression right? Uh, in my in my mind, I was calling that a sort of breadcrumb approach, like Hansel and Gretel, you know? I was trying to leave breadcrumbs for people to follow, so no matter where along the trail you fell onto the podcast and, and felt some kind, of, um, some kind of link to what was being discussed, you would be able to follow from that point on and probably not lose a step. But the problem with that approach is because these things were coming at me so fast it very quickly outshot what I was able to produce. So I started carrying around this little moleskin pocket notebook. I'm sure you've seen them. And anytime I had one of these new ideas or new concepts that would hit me, I'd write it in this book and sort of log it away for, all right, there's another one we got to get to eventually. And before you knew it, that book was full. And I had to put it aside realizing, man, I have only touched maybe 5% of what's in this notebook. And I'm buying now a second one. So I bought a second notebook and started carrying that around. Next thing you know, that one was filled up. And I still hadn't even come near to finishing the first one on the podcast. And then I bought a third notebook. And that one filled up. And a fourth. And that one filled up. And a fifth. And that one filled up. And it ended up being six full-to-the-brim, in-point-form notes, notebooks full of higher ideas meant to come onto this podcast. So I was already overloaded before this book even happened, and I was already getting frustrated that I was talking about last year, or even further than last year, on this podcast, while stuff was happening to me now that I really was excited about and really wanted to share. But because of this because of this logical one into the other step-by-step -step process I was trying to make for this podcast, it, it just became impossible. And so I think now coming back to the podcast after two years, the first thing I need to do is give up on that. And that's really tough because I don't want to lose anybody. I don't want, uh, I don't want to share enlightenment only for people that are near wherever I am right now. I want to share it for everybody. I want everyone to get access to the ladder and climb, you know? And, and I mean, it can't be denied that when you jump straight into the depth of anything, when you start to discuss the deeper concepts of anything in life, you're immediately putting up a sort of barrier that prevents entry for a lot of people that haven't done the preliminary work. So I hope I'm not losing a bunch of people by doing this, but the thing is, I'm tired of not being able to be me right now and express what's going on right now in my life, which is the most exciting stuff. So because of that, in order to make this podcast more now, and I think hopefully more alive, instead of talking about the past, more now, I'm going to have to give up on that idea. And I hope I don't lose any of you guys. I hope you guys stick around. Um, so what's going to be happening is I'm going to be going straight into the deep ends, coming back to the podcast, and if you stick around, I promise I'm going to be going back and creating content based on those old notes of mine, uh, fishing out the most pressing, the most uh, pertinent and important points in those notes, and sort of uh, 
backtracking a bit uh, while I move forward, if that makes sense. All that to say, the Higher Ideas podcast, which was taking its time and very progressively moving forward, will now shoot directly into the now, without any sort of um, hesitation. This should be quite a shift from whatever the last episodes were, even though we were getting there. In the last episodes, I remember we were talking about the paranormal. That's going to come into play, that sort of mystery of reality. And also, I've already made an episode about what this episode is talking about, but I've removed it because it was going to be a series, and I'm starting over here, so let's do that now. Let's do that here. Let's talk about the most necessary thing I need to talk about before I tell you guys what happened to me in 2013 and why I had to write a book about it. Let's get to the topic for today, and the topic for today is psychedelics. Psychedelics. Now, I know how a lot of people probably react to that word, because I used to react pretty negatively to that word myself. When I was at Occupy Toronto, which I've discussed in the early episodes of this podcast, uh, there's one thing I didn't mention, and that was, there was a guy on that camp that was just the most positive force uh, I have ever encountered in my life. This guy, whenever he came around, you just felt, we can do this. It was this non-pushy, just really uh, radiant, positive and happy and excited we can do this, we can change the world, we can, uh, you know, everything's going to be fine, everyone's awesome, let's do this. It was just the most invigorating energy that this guy had. It was the, the brightest, unselfish energy is what this guy had, and you could feel it whenever he came around. I always respected this guy just automatically because of that, and... I didn't know that this guy had actually started our Occupy Toronto camp on Facebook. He had taken the initiative to start the whole thing up. So, of course, that explained why he was so gung-ho, let's do this. But uh, there was just something about him that I couldn't put my finger on. And I always meant to talk to the guy. I always meant to sit down and find out a little bit more about him. But we were both really busy. There was a lot of stuff to do on that camp. And there was not a lot of people that were actually helping out. There was a lot of slackers, I hate to say, but it's true. Most of the people at that camp were not doing anything to help. They were a detriment, if anything. So the few of us that were actually pulling our weights and pulling everyone else's weight didn't have time to talk to each other. But then came a day where I was having lunch in the media tent, and he comes in, and he's doing stuff at the computer right beside me, looking like he's in a rush. But I'm thinking, hey, here's a chance to just engage him and find out a little bit more about him. And not very far into the conversation, I find out he's leaving. He's leaving the camp forever. And I was really surprised about that, because he was the most sort of energetic out of all of us. Well, it turns out he was getting threats. He was uh, being physically threatened with a knife and whatnot. His girlfriend was being harassed at the camp. Uh, sexually abused, I believe, by the same person that kept harassing them. And this person seemed to know a lot of really personal details about them that made him suspect that some kind of agencies were involved. It was getting really creepy on the camp. So he was leaving, which was too bad, but, you know, I couldn't blame him. You gotta make your choices. But in the short conversation I got to have with him before he left, you know, we exchanged the basic story of how we ended up being interested in this kind of movement, and I basically told him about my marijuana experiences and how I used to think marijuana was bad and for stupid people and come to find out it saves my life, it keeps me from killing myself, and heals me from severe pain that I was suffering with, keeping me alive long enough to get a solution. So I knew that marijuana was not what I had been told. The gate had already been opened in my mind for understanding that what I'm told about substances isn't always true and I should find out for myself. But still, when this guy told me uh, that, of course, he used marijuana too, but then went further and said he likes to use psychedelic mushrooms, I wasn't ready to hear it. And automatically, uh, you know, I hadn't done any work on my ego at the time, and automatically my ego stepped in and I demoted him in my respect level 
down a whole bunch of levels. Uh, I just sort of had this reaction of, ah, oh, that's too bad. He was so awesome. He was so positive, and I had so much respect for the guy. But he uses psychedelics. So sorry, that was a bit of a long story to explain. I understand. If uh, you hear me say psychedelics and you're having that kind of reaction of, ah, oh, that's too bad, he's a crazy person, or that's too bad, he's an idiot who does drugs, um, I understand. I used to be there. But, as I've always encouraged on this podcast, don't judge before finding out for yourself, right? That's ego. And if anything, please see this episode as an exercise in ego and keep listening and see if you hear anything uh, worth considering. So, as you might have guessed, my opinion on psychedelics has changed, just like it has done for marijuana, through experience, through seeing the real positive benefits it's had on my own life. And at this point, uh, I'm going to say right up front, psychedelics in my life have occupied a sacred place. Now, I know that's a whole other level to stretch people into, not only talking about psychedelics, but now also bringing in religious kind of feeling uh, terminology. But I've got to say it up front, there is some really spiritual stuff going on around psychedelics. This is serious stuff. Now, when I was younger, uh, you know, in high school and whatnot, or a young adult, I was under the impression that psychedelics uh, were useless. You just take a drug, it messes with your senses, and you hallucinate things. You think you see this or that. You know, I would think, oh, you see Donald Duck dancing on your ceiling upside down, and you laugh. What is the point of that? That's so stupid. I could just play a video game, or I could just watch a movie. Why do I need to take a drug and, and be subjected to that? And of course, that was sort of the school system uh, bias that had been put into me as a young person, that I had bought hook, line, and sinker, just like with marijuana. And you think I should have known better by then, but I didn't. I still didn't. I was still programmed in many ways by, you know, stuff we're told when we're very young. But after Occupy Toronto fell apart, and I found myself shrinking again, becoming sort of lost in life again, I was listening to a lot of podcasts, and I started hearing people talking about psychedelics on those podcasts, and talking about psychedelics in a way that was positive, just in the same way I had heard those same people talk about marijuana. And I found myself always nodding along and saying, like, Amen, brothers, everything they would say about marijuana. So when they started talking about psychedelics and how psychedelics can be a powerful force in a person's life for self-growth, for self-analysis, for self-healing, um, for spiritual advancement, for any number of enlightenments in one's life, to really look at yourself in a really... Uh, honest way and find the faults in your own character and fix them to become a stronger person that stuff was all ringing a very powerful bell inside of me because I am into that I am into self-improvement I am into enlightenment I am into uh, looking at the truth of things beyond denial or preferences just really seeing things for what they are and 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 acting accordingly so you see everything lined up I had this guy from Occupy that had seen so awesome, and I had misjudged him about psychedelics, prejudged him about psychedelics, and here I am hearing other people I respect talking about the same stuff in a positive way. I just had to find out. I had to find out for myself. So I got some mushrooms, and I had been doing a lot of research about how best to take them, so I took them by myself, a small dose to begin with, and in a respectful way, in a silent room, or with some soft, wordless music, in dim lighting, in a comfortable surrounding, in my bed. Uh, and I just explored and saw what would happen. And it didn't take very long. In fact, it only took one session before I was convinced that there is some really powerful stuff going on inside psychedelics. So, for those who don't know, I'll just quickly explain what happens when you take a psychedelic. Now, by and large, the reputation of psychedelics is, of course, hallucination. People think you take a psychedelic, you see things. But I actually think, uh, after the experiences I've had, I don't think hallucination should be uh, what psychedelics are known for, because I don't think it is the primary action of a psychedelic. 
the primary action of a psychedelic, the, the, the most basic thing it's going to do to you is not hallucination. You don't always even hallucinate. But what always does happen when you take a dose of psychedelics that's sufficient enough is your ego dissolves. So psychedelics are not hallucinogenic. They're ego dissolving. And if anything, that's one basic correction I'd like to try and uh, get people to think about. And what is that, ego dissolving? Well, we've talked a bit about ego on the podcast, and you may now understand that the reason we talk about ego is because of my psychedelic use, and how much it's made me come up against the ego and understand that it's actually at the core of all of your personal problems, and all of the societal problems we have. What happens when you take a psychedelic is your ego gets the hell out of your way. The ego is a really insidious, uh, just, it's, it serves a purpose, okay? The ego keeps you alive. The ego is your sense of self-preservation. It's the part of you that looks out for you. And there's nothing wrong with that. We all need that to survive. If we all had no egos, we'd just sit around and let the lions eat us. You know, we wouldn't even feed ourselves. We wouldn't care. We would realize that, uh, you know, all things are one. You don't need to worry about anything. And then we just all die. So the ego is important uh, to some degree. But ego out of control becomes very, very disruptive and becomes actually a force for illness in a life and on the planet. So to get that out of the way, even for a couple hours, such as a psychedelic session, is so healing just in itself. In that most basic of ways, in that most basic behavior, psychedelics are already healing for a person. Because you're hurting yourself in so many ways right now, and you are hurting people around you in so many ways that you don't even realize, because your ego has you wrapped around its little finger. And what's worse, you think you're your ego which is another kind of uh, misalignment in the human mind that psychedelics corrects. Uh, there's just so much you can learn only about ego by taking a psychedelic. And even only on that front, it's worth doing at least once in your life. Just to understand, really understand what it's like, who you are without an ego. You understand so much more about yourself in that moment. And you get to see the division between you and ego. And once you come back together at the end of that session, things are never quite the same if you really absorb what's happened. You could turn around and ignore what you've learned in a psychedelic session and, and, and have absolutely no growth. It's entirely your choice. But if you take what you learn in a psychedelic and then integrate it into your life, make changes based on what you now know to be true, uh, I'm telling you, there is no limit to how much your life can improve. There is no limit to how much you can see yourself grow. There is no limit to to what can be accomplished. I mean, really, it is a force. It is a tool. It is an invaluable human tool, especially in the battle against ego. But you know what? Maybe at this point, it would be helpful to go in with an example of what I'm talking about. So a very basic example is this. Say you've got a person who's severely addicted to cigarettes. They are smoking a pack a day. They're just taking a break every five minutes to go outside and have one, maybe two cigarettes at a time. They're just, they're just dying of cigarettes. And their friends, of course, being outside of this person, can see clearly what's going on. This is a person on a self-destruct course. And if they care about this person, they'll try to approach them and intervene, right? A friend will take him aside and say, hey, man, listen, you know, the cigarette thing, maybe you should think about cutting back or, you know, maybe you should see a doctor or something. Like, this is really starting to worry about you, man, right? How many, how many of us have been in this position on either side of the fence? Well, for the person being confronted, ego immediately comes in because this person already has issues going on and they're probably already defensive. So the ego will immediately come to the quote-unquote rescue for this person and what happens? Of course, we know they'll spit out all of the usual lines. I can quit when I want to. You don't run my life. Don't tell me what to do. You're not my mother, right? I can make my own choices. I'm an adult, you know? Uh, blah, blah, blah. All of these different things will come out. But all of those shut down the conversation in its tracks. And the person inside 
who who reacted this way is no closer to getting out of their their predicaments. They're still addicted to cigarettes. They might end up smoking more, hating themselves more because they realize, man, life sucks and, you know, my friends care about me, but fuck it, whatever. You know, there's so many reasons a person does a thing like that. But most of the time, the care of another human being won't be enough to fish someone out of that deep an ego hole. Now, take this person and give them three grams of mushrooms, the typical psychedelic dose, and leave them in a room by themselves with a a comfortable environment. Don't guide them in any way. Just be there for them in case they need help if you're experienced. And let them have a session. And I can almost guarantee, I would be willing to bet money that within that first session, cigarettes will come up. And that person, uh, released from their ego and their defensiveness and everything will see by themselves what their friends see. They'll see, holy crap, my body is aching right now. My lungs hurt. My teeth hurt. My sinuses are sore. I can taste cigarette on my breath all of a sudden. I wasn't tasting it before. Why the hell do I do this to myself? Oh crap, yeah, I do this because I don't care about myself. I don't enjoy life. I have wasted my potential. Uh, when I was young, my father left the family, and I feel like I've been rejected by a father figure. I feel unwanted. I feel unworthy. I feel there's no point in continuing on, and I'm slowly killing myself, but I'm not brave enough to kill myself, so I'll just poison myself slowly while pleasuring myself with this chemical. It's such a complex, right? Whatever the nuance of this individual's complex, they'll see it. It'll come to them. Guaranteed. And in this state, of being free from their ego, it won't even hurt to look at it. They'll just see it. And they'll realize, okay, do I need this? And if they are a person that wants to improve, a person that wants to uh, survive, that wants to heal, that is a golden opportunity to decide right there in a moment. No more of this. This changes today because now I understand I understand. doesn't matter if anybody else understands and tries to tell me. Until I understand, it has no power, really. But when you finally understand something about yourself, and you see the complex, and you don't shy away from it, it becomes so easy to correct them. It's like rewriting your own operating system. It gives you editorial control on you, which is something you should have. You're in control of you, aren't you? Nobody should be able to tell you what you can do with your own self. And taking a psychedelic is like taking off that read-only checkbox on a file and giving yourself a window to rewrite whatever you see that needs rewriting. And of course that takes discipline, because after a psychedelic session, your ego creeps back in. You come back together. You you re-solidify, as it were. And the ego will try to convince you to give up on what you've learned. But, like I said, you have the opportunity. You have a a moment, you have a window, an opening to choose. And if you do choose, you'll find yourself growing. You find yourself healing. You find yourself evolving in ways that you never imagined you could. You find yourself, for the first time in your life, possibly, in control of your life. And that is a powerful thing. And that's why psychedelics are an invaluable tool for any human being that is interested in maximizing the human self, human potential, even just for themselves. Now, I could go on and on about psychedelics and all the different ways that uh, they've healed me personally, the ways they've healed others. I could just keep going. But I'm trying to keep it simple here and get to the point. But I hope I'm already showing you, for those of you who have never thought about this before, uh, why it's so uh, serious and important to me. This is no joke. This is not the junk stuff you've been told it is. It is only junk stuff for people who use it with a junk attitude, just like marijuana. Um, But in the hands of someone who's mature, who is uh, interested in, in growth and and depth of exploration of the human experience and the self, uh, all of those plant 
medicines are just gold. They're just powerhouses, all in their different ways. And look, realization in life uh, comes whether you go after it or not. So in the example of the smoker, there is basically two outcomes that could happen. Either this person will realize what I've just described when they find out they have cancer. When they're sitting in the doctor's office and the doctor says, I'm sorry, you've got cancer, you're fucked. I know the doctor's not going to say that, but that's how the person will feel. They will have all at once a brutal awakening about, oh my God, what have I done to my body? Why have I done this? I'm such a fool, right? The same exact thing that happens in a psychedelic experience, except life had to come in and sledgehammer them in the face for that to happen. But if you take a psychedelic, you realize it in a completely non-destructive way. You, you, you shortcut to the enlightenment without having to go through the misery of, of killing yourself to learn, right? I mean, I'm talking about realization through death versus realization through life. Now, that is some deep, heavy stuff. That's two different roads to travel. And in my opinion, psychedelics are completely polarized towards life. Um, the kinds of lessons, the kinds of content that will come at you in a psychedelic experience always seem very, very focused on health, on restoring any system you turn your attention to, to a healthy balance, to a life-preserving um, dynamic, and away from destruction, away from uh, disbalance, away from ego, basically. It is the counterforce for ego. It is a medicine against ego. I just can't say enough about it. I'm sorry if I'm getting off track or anything, but uh, now that I'm finally talking about it, I just, uh, I just can't say enough about this stuff. But that being said, uh, don't get me wrong. It's not like uh, you take psychedelics every day and get addicted to them. Going through a psychedelic experience is always an ordeal. Uh, it's not always bad. I mean, it could be beautiful, but it's always an ordeal. It's always a, an impact on your body for, for whatever amount of time it's hitting you. You don't go out and party in the depth of a really deep psychedelic experience. You just want to wrap yourself in a blanket. It's kind of like having a flu, right? So it's not the thing that, that you, you would do every day. It's more of an ally in life. It's more of a, a, a checkpoint, that when you feel life is starting to go wrong again, when you feel your ego is getting the best of you, maybe after a couple of months, you have another session, and then everything lines up again, and you're good for a while. I mean, when I started using psychedelics, I was using them very frequently because I was exploring, and I was feeling out dosages, I was testing theories out, but it eventually stabilized to maybe uh, one experience every six months. And I've gone even further than that because sometimes you just are still working on what you, you learned last time. And sometimes the stuff that comes up is tough to look at. I mean, I'm not going to pretend this is all sunshine and rainbows. I've had some really difficult psychedelic experiences, but always, always they have been healing and they've instigated growth. So uh, it's it's a very nuanced experience. It's a very multifaceted experience. It's a fascinating realm. And it really is like a realm. But I'll get into that. Now, psychedelics have been a part of human growth for a really long time. Uh, even today, pretty much every culture that still lives close to nature, so in the Amazon, uh, you know, native tribes here and there all over the world, people that are still living in that healthy, balanced way with the environment, uh, come into contact with the local psychedelics because they're just there. They're everywhere. They're in all sorts of different plants and animals and, and, and natural materials. And people just seem to always find them and develop very sacred relationships with them. In all of these cultures, the people who become sort of the shepherds of these substances are the spiritual leaders, are the wise men, are the medicine men. And that's for good reason, because as I said earlier, there is some heavy spiritual uh, connotation to this experience that I don't even need to really explain. You just have to have a few sessions, and you know this is soul food. This is, this is, this is almost like communing with God. 
Now I know, another trigger word, God, I'm, I'm taking us through all sorts of ego minefields, but I don't mean God in any specific religious way. I just mean if there's a mind out there, if there is a sort of consciousness to the universe itself, which I believe there is, that's a God, right? That's God. And when you are in a psychedelic experience and your ego dissolves, you realize things such as we really are all one. And that is scientifically true, because we are part of nature's system. We are all one, just like all of your skin cells create one you, one y your skin, right? Just like all of your intestinal cells create your intestines, they are all one. But they are also each one, right? So it is with humans, with animals, with everything. We are all one, we are all part of this earth which is like a living being. And that's the kind of realization you have when your ego is out of the way. Because your ego is completely constrictive, completely makes you forget that and focus on, I am me, everyone else is external, and screw everyone, let's keep me alive. But in those moments where it's out of the way, everything becomes clear. We are all one. The earth is one. And it doesn't take that much to extend beyond that and see... Everything is one. The whole universe is one, right? It, it just spirals into deeper and deeper levels. And next thing you know, you feel like you understand everything. Uh, there's no end to the understandings that could be found in a psychedelic experience. And so you could understand a thinker like me, uh, yeah, you could get really deep into this stuff, and you could spend a lifetime working with it and never find the bottom. And in fact, those shamans in those societies uh, who, who administer psychedelics and guide people through the experience, they spend their entire lives working with this stuff. And they never find the bottom. They each explore different directions, and they compare notes, and they start to sort of build a view of what's going on in there. But it is a massive... I would say it is as huge as the universe is. That's how much there is to explore in the psychedelic experience. Um, and maybe you could even say, I'm getting a little crazy here, but maybe you could even say you are exploring the universe in a psychedelic experience. Maybe you can say it's another way to explore this universe on another level, on a mental level, on a spiritual level. And that's where it gets really spiritual, because you see that there is a reality to this once you start working with it. Now, I know that this is probably sounding pretty wacky to some people. And, you know, thanks for sticking around. But I'm about to test you uh, with one extra level to this. Now, I've just spent a bunch of time explaining the healing benefits of psychedelics. And in fact, there are documented, scientifically proven now, uh, ways that psychedelics absolutely heal post-traumatic stress all sorts of mental complexes, just like with that smoker example, you can see how a person could go in with a really complicated mess in their head and come out possibly able to put it away if it becomes clear to them in the experience. So it's like a really masterful therapist that knows you better than a therapist would, that is psychic because it's in your head, and that seems to really precisely target what's wrong with you. So in that sense, yes, it's healing, and that's the way it's kind of coming into the mainstream, you see? The same way that marijuana is coming into the mainstream very soon, because of the undeniable medical benefits it has, and psychological and whatnot, uh, so is psychedelics coming in on the heels of that in the exact same way. There are organizations of really professional people that are representing it and bringing it in in a very controlled way like that. But... There is a sort of downside to this approach, and that is that there's a minimizing of the the value to just a personal human life. The spiritual value of marijuana isn't often discussed. The life-enhancing value of marijuana isn't often discussed because we can't bring it into the legal channels that way. So it's forced to be minimized while we maximize the medical argument, right? And minimize the religious arguments or the, 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 just the personal freedom argument. Same with psychedelics. And I'm going to freak you out a little bit here, because there's something going on in psychedelics, on top of what I've mentioned so far, 
that is not often discussed. And it is probably the most controversial uh, aspect of psychedelics, and that's probably why um, it isn't brought up very often. But I'm going to bring it up right now, because the Higher Ideas podcast is about the truth of things, is about not shying away from saying the big, bold statement. So, here it is. In the psychedelic experience, pretty much with any natural sourced psychedelic that I've touched, uh, pretty much each one except LSD, which is not from a natural source, it's a synth- synthesized, but with any plant-based or mushroom-based or uh, you know animal-based psychedelic, there truly seems to be external intelligence at work in the experience. And by that I mean, very often in a psychedelic experience, you will come upon, in a sort of a psychic way, come upon a, a, a communication with another mind that is not you. Now, a person might say, uh, how do you know it's not you? Maybe you're just imagining things. That's true. That could very well be. But the thing is, until you've had that experience, you may not understand that your own thoughts have a signature. And of course, we don't know that because each of us spend our lives with only our thoughts in our head. Uh, we're not psychic creatures, right? By At least not usually. And we're not used to having external thoughts just beamed into our heads. But when it happens to you, which will often happen during a psychedelic session, there's just no denying. You just realize, holy crap, this thought just came along the conveyor belt of my thoughts, and it is completely exotic. It's not mine. It's not related to any thought I was having. It just showed up. And it feels, it has a signature on it that is from another being. It's not me. It, maybe it comes from another person. Maybe it comes from a disembodied being of some energetic realm we don't understand. But no matter what, here is a thought that isn't mine. But it is often the wisest, most helpful, most healing thought that could have come down the line. So it seems like there's an external intelligence at work in the depths of the psychedelic experience that is watching out for you and trying to interact. There is communication happening with external intelligences that really do seem to be there. And yeah, that's a big statement to make, but uh, I'm speaking now on my own experience, and I have had some really dramatic run-ins with these external intelligences. Um... And I know, I know how crazy it sounds. I know, okay, please uh, understand that I realize what a huge stretch this is for someone that may have never heard about psychedelics before. And it's already a big stretch for people that may only be beginning with psychedelics and not encountered this yet. But I'm telling you, if you work with this stuff for any length of time, you start to really feel that there are beings, as strange as that word is, there's just no word that sounds normal to describe this. So I'm just going to say beings, or external intelligences, that are... who knows what they are? That is one of the deepest mysteries of the psychedelic experience that I've run into so far, is who are these external minds that truly seem to be there, that don't seem human... Are they forces of nature? Are they spirits of nature? See, the shamans uh, and you know all the other experts in these psychedelics describe them as spirits. They just call them spirits. They catalog them. They know how many like they don't know how many they are total, but they know how many they've run into. They compare notes and figure out that there is really a concrete ecology of beings out there in this psychedelic psychic realm which can be encountered, and a sort of exchange of information can happen, where usually we're the bigger beneficiaries because they are absolutely benevolent and helpful and guiding forces. And yeah, some could say there are sinister ones out there, uh, but I think responsible use in a positive environment probably keeps that stuff away. Uh, I'm no expert. I'm just talking about what I've experienced so far. But that is a mystery, don't you agree? That is a big one. And that opens up the gate to all sorts of spiritual questions. And it gets really strange because a lot of times these communications that may happen 
give you information that you had no way of knowing that sometimes turns out to be true. And that's really mind-blowing. Sometimes it's premonitions. Sometimes it's just uh, information from something someone else knows that you don't know. And then when you ask them later, they know it. They know it was true. What does that mean? That's impossible, right? There's all sorts of uh, bordering on paranormal and even stepping way into paranormal mysteries that are around psychedelics. So this stuff is to be respected. This stuff is to be treated as a, a spiritual tool, not just a sort of mechanical tool. There's an exchange going on there that people need to be ready for when they're encountering this stuff because it may hit you on your first visit or it may take a while, but it's big. It's a big thing to swallow. I realize that. I just thought I'd represent it here as, as one of the most uh, vast questions that comes up during these sessions. So I think that's psychedelics in a nutshell. Uh, you know, I could touch on a lot more details, but I think uh, as, a, as a way zoomed out overview, this is psychedelics in a very mature view, not the government fear-mongering view, uh, and not the fanatical woo-woo view. You know, this is as balanced a view as I can provide from my experience uh, about what I've experienced and found so far. And listen, the impact on my own life, personally, has been a godsend, has been immeasurably positive. Um, AS has been challenging. Uh, I mean, look, I quit my job to write a book about what turns out to be a psychedelic experience. Um, that could be seen as a negative, quitting your job. Hey, guy lost his job. He was making good money. Now he's unemployed. That could be a negative. But I have to keep my eye on me, on my life, on my health, on my happiness, on my uh, how am I affecting others around me. And when I look at that overview, despite the things that could be seen as negative effects, uh, the effects have been amazingly healing and overwhelmingly positive and empowering and invigorating and, and enlightening. Enlightening! This is what this podcast is about, sharing enlightenment. So I'm not trying to convince anybody to go and take psychedelics. I'm just sharing what I've experienced. And if it affects you that way, hey, so be it. More power to you. Explore reality. Find out for yourself. I will say that about anything I talk about. But even if you just take this episode as a curious case to consider, uh, another view to, to sort of digest... I hope you'll still stick around to the podcast, because although I will be talking about psychedelics going forward and weird, spirity stuff once in a while, um, remember the content that's been on the podcast so far. That flavor of content is still going to be on the podcast. I'm still going to just look at basic facts of life, just as I've been doing before, mixed in with this psychedelic content, because... To be honest, it has become a huge part of who I am. Uh, and to sort of try and negate that, to try to hide it or put it under the rug because it might make people uncomfortable, uh, that doesn't work. Because then I'm, I'm cutting off half of what I can say about anything. So, welcome to the new me. Welcome to the whole and honest me. Uh, we're only getting started. But I had to talk about this. Before we get to the next episode, which is going to be a video, so do keep an eye on the website for the next week or so, uh, or sign up to YouTube, my YouTube channel, and find it there, because the next episode I will probably be appearing on camera just to tell this whopper of a story that I ran into in 2013, which is about psychedelics, uh, but so much more, and uh, which is what this book is based on. So... That's it for now, and thank you for sticking around. If you're still watching the updates on this podcast, wow, you're amazing. I don't even know how you were this patient. And if you still remember who the hell I am, you know, welcome me back. But maybe we'll get some new listeners moving forward with these new topics, and hopefully I won't lose anybody. And really, if, if you're feeling challenged by anything I'm saying, please talk to me. Please post on the YouTube version of, uh, of 
of these episodes or contact me through email or find me on Facebook and talk to me there. Uh, I am always willing to compare views to back up what I'm talking about and, and, and uh, face it off against criticism. I'm always willing to do that. So thank you, fellow human, for sticking around. Uh, look forward to new content moving forward. After I get over explaining the story in the book, we can get back to those six damn notebooks of content. New Mind Yoga videos are coming. Uh, all sorts of awesome stuff is coming down the pipe. Now that I am free, free at last, to work on my damn podcast again, it's been a really long time. And uh, that's it. That's it, fellow human, for this episode of Higher Ideas. Look forward to more. And as always, keep thinking.